Welcome everyone to our webinar, Healthcare Interpreter Certification, How It Affects Quality of Care and Risk Management. Let me do brief introductions first. Um, my name is Natalia Mitareva and I'm one of the founding commissioners of the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters and CCHI's current managing director. Prior to this, from 2000 to 2013, I was communications director at the International Institute of Akron, a nonprofit refugee resettlement agency in Ohio, where I supervised interpreting and translation services and cultural competence training along with refugees community outreach. Locally, I've been involved in issues of equal access to healthcare for refugees and immigrants. And um, my educational background is a combined bachelor's and master's from Volgograd State University in philology in Russia. Um, I'm exceptionally happy to share the webinar today with my colleague and friend, uh, Shiva Bidasilov. Uh, Shiva is director of interpreter services and community partnerships at UW Health in Madison, Wisconsin. Shiva is a nationally renowned expert in the field of medical interpreting and a published author. She was a founding commissioner of CCHI as well and is a, was a co-chair of the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare. Shiva is the vice chair of the Dane County Latino Health Council and an executive committee member of the Latina Support Network. She is the 2005 recipient of the Madison YWCA Woman of Distinction Award for her work in fighting inequality and eliminating racism. She obtained her bachelor's from School of Interpreters in Belgium and her master's from Monterey Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California. We will start the conversation with Shiva telling us uh, about um, her uh, experience at W Health, uh, why they support certification, how they accomplished the uh, the fact that all of their interpreters are certified and what are the next steps they're thinking. Then I will talk about the state of the healthcare interpreting industry and the national certification process and go over the logistics of the interpreter certification so that you can understand what is involved here. And we will have the uh, question and answer session at the end. So without further ado, let me uh, give the floor to Shiva. Um, and. Um, uh, I'm excited as you are to hear uh, about your experience. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really my pleasure to be able to join you for this um, webinar. Thank you, Natalia, for the introduction. Um, since I work for an academic healthcare center, I wanted to also make sure to disclose that I'm not going, getting paid or remunerated in any way to do this webinar. Um, it's really my intent to share with you um, a little bit of our experience and our journey in making sure that we um, provide quality language access for the um, limited English proficient patients that we serve in our area. Um, so with that, um, let me um, start with giving you a little bit of a background on who UW Health is. Um, so we are an integrated health system or an academic health system that serves patients across the state of Wisconsin. Um, we are based in Madison, Wisconsin, but again, we, we serve patients throughout the state of Wisconsin. We have four hospitals as part of our system, and then we have um, regional hospitals um, in um, rural areas that we work with closely, and we provide comprehensive health um, access from primary care to specialty and subspecialty care, um, and have a health insurance um, HMO that is affiliated with our organization. So um, again, kind of a, a larger academic healthcare center. Um, with that, let me um, talk to you a bit about um, the work that we've been doing around just overall um, commitment to, to patients. Um, and I, I always feel that it's really important to put our work around language access within the context of health equity and the work that um, is talked about often in organizations about healthcare disparities and health equity. Um, so certainly, I've always um, been a, a huge um, advocate in our organization that health equity cannot be achieved without appropriate language access. Um, that language access um, is an integral piece um, of the work that we need to do um, to provide equitable care. Um, and that quality care is also uh, impossible without quality communication. Um, as an aside, I would say that one of the questions that I know often um, uh, is asked is, where does language access and interpreter services um, report within an organization? And I actually, as a director of 
um, Community Partnership and Interpreter Services report to our Senior Vice President for Quality and Safety. Um, and that has been very helpful for me as um, we talk about the issues of um, certification and advocating for um, certified interpreters because there is a clear understanding in kind of my reporting um, of uh, quality and the importance um, of quality in the provision of services for our patients and families. So um, really being able to make the, the argument around the quality of care has been um, a critical part of um, advocating for certification of interpreter. Um, and then, you know, really taking the issues of health equity and quality of care and making a, a, a really good um, business case really for national certification um, was a part of our journey. It's it, um, it's interesting to me to see it in a bullet because it seems like it wasn't a really easy process. You know, you can kind of draw draw from health equity and quality care and say, well, of course we need to have a way to ensure um, that our interpreters are competent. But it really um, wasn't um, as easy, um, and I think that that's part of um, the, the learning that I would like to, to share um, with you today. So um, certainly I um, use um, a lot of the conversations around compliance with language access requirement as a basis for advocating for a way for us to ensure that our interpreters were um, competent. Um, so um, the Title VI of Civil Rights Act um, and the corresponding DHHS guidance, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, the National Cultural and Linguistically Appropriate Services Standards that were published by the Office for Minority Health at the federal level, and then the Joint Commission Accreditation Standards mandate that providers ensure meaningful access to health care for patients with limited English proficiency. And I'll go into a little bit more detail um, on, on um, those areas. But um, really making the point that meaningful language access really depends on the competency of interpreter, that it is really uh, impossible to state that one has meaningful language access certainly when one uses ad hoc interpreters and untrained interpreters, but also when one uses interpreters that um, whose competency um, have not been assessed in any formal way. Um, so the um, Department of Health and Human Services guidance um, says that recipients should be aware of, that the competency um, requires more than self-identification as bilingual. So if you just read that, um, then the question that comes to mind is then what else um, do we need to ensure competency? Um, the class standards, so the culturally and linguistically appropriate services standard, the standard number seven, um, states that we should ensure the competence of individual providing language assistance. And the Joint Commission standards, the new standards that went into effect um, two years ago, and I was part of the advisory group that advised the Joint Commission on revising their um, their standards around um, culture and language. So one of the standards says the staff, and it, it, worth, it uses the word staff are competent to perform their responsibilities, but I can tell you from my experience in my Joint Commission um, reviews that we've had in my organization that they extend the word staff to be really a broad definition of anybody that really is working um, in any areas. And especially if they are going to be working in any of the clinical areas. That doesn't mean that they have to be clinicians or providers, but that they're involved in some way in the continuum of clinical services for, the, uh, for patients. Um, a quick um, example that I can give you of that is that the last time, actually, that we had a visit by Joan Commission in my organization, um, which was two years ago, so it was right before we started implementing the, the requirement for um, certification for anybody who is going to be um, in the role of interpreter in our organization. Um, the Joint Commission reviewers um, looked at our policy, but then they went, as they do, um, to observe um, interactions with patients and to follow a patient's um, kind of journey um, as a tracer within um, our um, hospital system. So they actually ended up going to one of the outpatient clinics and they observed a um, bilingual social worker, um, and um, that bilingual social worker spoke in Spanish, doing her job as a social worker with the family. But then the physician came back in the room, and that social worker acted as an interpreter for um, um, for the family. 
and the Joint Commission surveyor um, then asked to meet with me. Um, those are one of those moments in which your phone and your pager start ringing and, and you have to drop everything and go. And she had two questions. One, how had we assessed the, comp the bilingual competency of the social worker? And two, how had we assessed her competency as an interpreter? So clearly, I think that there has been a, a huge increase in the level of education and understanding um, of our accreditation organization that uh, um, one, we need to have language access provided, but two, who are the individuals? And in this case, clearly understanding what I thought was really a, a depth of level of understanding of language access, which was, you know, how do you assess bilingualism and how do you assess actually interpreter competency? And those are two separate things. So um, the question really in, in itself, um, I think, says a lot about where um, the expectations of the accreditation agencies are um, nowadays. So, so with that, so really understanding those requirements and um, that all point to competency, to a way of assessing competency. Um, so after I really um, made a strong, um, I think, case in my organization, and I can tell you that one of the catalysts was that visit from Joint Commission. Um, and using um, the fact that don't, don't, the Joint Commission surveyor had really asked those in-depth questions as a way to um, move the issue forward in my organization. But once I had made a, a case really that it was about health equity um, and that um, it was about quality of um, patient care and that all our accreditation um, uh, organizations were pointing towards a way for us to be able to document, assess competency and have a documentation that such competency had been indeed assessed, um, then um, I was um, given the task of making sure that it implemented a way to really show the competency of interpreters. So this is really the how we did it. Um, so the one thing I can tell you is that it was really important to involve all stakeholders. And I think that we had some um, places in which if I were to do it again, um, I would have maybe done it better. And this is one of those areas. I think we were very good at involving the interpreters and our administration. Um, maybe we weren't always as good um, when we started our journey to require um, certification, national certification for all our interpreters in involving um, our providers, so direct care providers. Um, and some of the communities that were going to be um, affected by this change of expectation on our part. So I think it was really important to in involve everybody. Involving the interpreters, um, the reason that was a little bit um, easier for us was that um, I had been personally working in our community with the interpreters that we had. So these were um, a lot of them staff interpreters at any of our healthcare organization, but many also um, contract interpreters that we were using um, on an as-needed basis. Now, the the one thing that I would say is a little bit different in our um, area than in in many other areas is that we don't we don't have a lot of agencies. We contract directly with individual interpreters, but. Um, even if there are two agencies, we had been working really with, with the interpreters in making sure that they were getting the amount of training that they needed to prepare for certification. And part of the reason was that I um, have been involved in the, in the world of um, language access in healthcare for a very long time. Um, I was, uh, um, as Natalia mentioned, the co-chair of the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare. And even back when we created the National Council on Interpreting in Healthcare, which is back when I was 10 years old in 1997, um, we knew that at some point we wanted to achieve the goal of having some level of cert national certification available for interpreters. So in my work as um, the um, director of interpreter services in our area, I always wanted to make sure that we were spending the, the resources and the time to prepare the interpreters so that the day cert national certification became available, that most of our interpreters would be prepared um, as far as their skills to be able to take that national certification. So we had been offering a lot of um, training um, that we had sponsored as, again, a collaboration of healthcare organizations in our area. Um, we had done collaboration with our technical college in our area to start offering both continuing education um, kind of offerings around uh, medical interpreting and also certificate program in medical interpreting. So 
many of the interpreters that we were um, already um, having work in our um, medical um, field had um, been able to take advantage of these offerings. And we were, we were offered every year for the past, I think, 15 years, we've offered um, bridging the gap as one also another way of, of um, having interpreters have a, at least an origin, a first 40-hour training. And, and um, we were offering that. Um, with um, the sponsorship of other healthcare organizations, meaning that you know, interpreters uh, really pay a very, very minimal amount to be able to take those training, and the rest of it is covered by us healthcare organizations. Because um, I, I knew that, um, especially for the languages of lesser diffusion, there was going to be a barrier for interpreters to be able to pay for training. So many of our interpreters had gone to um, some level of already of training already in our area. So th that really um, presented a great opportunity for us to be able to have those interpreters take the certification exam because they had already completed some of the prerequisite of taking the certification exam. Um, and I, I, I'll use some numbers. So we had um, in my organization, Amongst all of our healthcare organizations here in the in the Madison area, we had about 150 medical interpreters that we were using um, to um, help and assist our um, patients and families. So our kind of cohort of of interpreters, our N was about 150 interpreters um, when we started kind of this journey in requiring certification. The providers. So the second piece was involving the providers. So there were um, there were a lot of conversations and communication with the providers to let them know in advance um, of requiring the certification that that we were going to move towards that requirement, and that because we were going to move towards that requirement, that we expected to see that we were going to have a decrease in the number of um, interpreters that we were going to be able to have available face-to-face -face in person because we knew that um, we weren't going to be able to get one everybody through certification um, as quickly as we wanted and that there were going to be some um, of the interpreters that were going to self um, uh, eliminate themselves from the pool of those who were interested even in, in going through a certification process and then there was going to be those who um, when taking it the first time were potentially were not going to uh, pass the certification exam. So we, I really did a lot of outreach in letting the, the providers know, but I always, again, put that in the context, though I know that you're going to potentially see less in-person interpreter, but this is because we really want to Im invest in our pa and quality care for our patient, and in um, this is a really a long-term investment that we're making as an organization. The third a um, group of stakeholders was our administration, obviously, and getting their buy-in. Again, um, because of um, my um, reporting structure into quality and safety, it was um, great for me to be able to have our senior VP of quality and safety be really a kind of a, a champion for this work in senior administration. But the other person that was really a good champion for this was our chief medical officer in the, in the um, health system because he really um, understood um, very well the difference as a provider, as a doctor for him that interpreters had made when they were, there was quality interpreters involved. So he was he's always been a, a really good um, champion for interpreter services. But through the championship, we had to change our policy, right? So we ha I had to have this um, senior leadership support a change in our policy for the organization in which our policy states um, now um, and stated when we made the switch that all our interpreters, only those who are nationally certified are um, qualified interpreters within our UW health system. So those are, that's the, the um, language that's used in our policy. So it says um, UW health qualified interpreter are um, nationally certified medical interpreters. And so it really kind of um, sets a, a standard by policy. Um, with no exceptions to that. Um, and then involving the community, so that was also another piece that was important. Um, again, that, that I, I want to make sure um, we always keep in mind because the communities, so the, the communities that, that we serve with, with um, interpreter services, 
informing, again, community contacts, whether those are refugee resettlement agencies, agencies that serve immigrant communities, and letting them know and communicating about this change to make sure that they know why is it that we're going through it. And I had, you know, really great support from those agencies. It was just a matter of informing them and that they would also know that, again, there may be a time in which we were going to see a decrease in number of interpreters um, because we had to get everybody uh, to go through the certification process. Um, so what, were the, what was the hardest part? Um, it was the transition and the change, as um, everybody I'm sure knows that's on the call. Trans change is always uh, um, difficult and challenging. So transitioning into a new way of doing things um, was certainly um, had its challenges. Um, especially at the very beginning, I would say the first six months in which we change our policies. So from a, again operational level, I would tell you that what we did is we actually announced to all our interpreters that we were going to ask them to have certification and gave them um, actually, we ended up giving them nine months. We started with giving them six months, but it ended up being really nine months for everybody to go through the certification process. So. Um, we gave them that window before we then said, okay, if you haven't obtained it by this date, then you're now no longer going to be able to um, be an interpreter for our um, health system. Um, so that, that time of transition of change um, was a difficult time. A number of interpreters um, kind of had to decide during that time whether they were really committed enough to or had enough, um, really honestly enough, um, hours as interpreters, especially in the languages of lesser diffusion, that it made their worth their um, investment to really go through the certification process. Some of our interpreters um, had um, been interpreting for a very long time and, and this was you know their opportunity to decide whether they were going to go into retirement or whether they were going to go through certification. So we saw kind of quite a, a, a lot of changes in, in um, um, people who kind of wanted to, to um, invest, to stay. There were some, some of our interpreters who really um, uh, were trying to figure out the challenge of uh, paying the cost of, uh, of certification and had to kind of look at that and figure that out. So um, it was, a, a, in that sense, a difficult time of, of transition. Um, but um, the fact that um, we you know, that we have actually an interpreter services department. Um, I have a team leader that works um, with me, my department and myself to support the interpreters and to really um, kind of be um, cheerleaders for, for this and, and really um, be cheerleaders for the interpreters in say, telling them that really this, this was really a great thing for their profession that um, once we obtained certification, and I'm myself a certified interpreter, um, that once we had certification that this was really going to um, highlight our role and our, our professional standing within um, the healthcare team um, was very important for those interpreters. So we kind of function really, um, I think, as a support team to the interpreters. Um, the other thing that I, I want to highlight is that we did this as a collaboration of all the healthcare systems within our area. So it wasn't just UW Health moving towards this requirement of, of certification. It was all the other health system um, within our area. And we've had a long history of collaborating and having common um, standards for language access amongst all of the healthcare providers um, in our area. So there is nine of us. We actually meet on a regular basis, come up with kind of the standards around language access, discuss issues that we are having and barriers in language access. So when we decided that we were moving to certification, we did it all together, which again created both an incentive for the interpreters um, to know that this was going to be a requirement for any of the healthcare systems that they were going to be working for, um, and also um, created a, a I would say, base um, of um, support from the community because the community knew that we were all working together in trying to have the same standard um, for their access, um, language access in our health systems across um, our county. Um, 
And the way that I looked really at the hardest part it was like it was there were short term issues but really keeping our eye on the on the prize and knowing that this was a long term investment. Um especially and I would say a long term investment um in the profession of medical interpreting, in the quality of care for our patients and families above all. But in a very selfish way, I would say it was also a long-term investment in my personal peace of mind as the person that is the director of interpreter services. I can tell you that I would find myself oftentimes um, just feeling a level of stress and worry um, before um, I was able to state that all our interpreters had gone through a certification process because I wasn't always, I, I we, you know, we had and. You know, we wouldn't have time for me to explain what we were doing before certification, but we had some processes to kind of assess the qualification of interpreters. But they were really um, our internal processes that we had developed, our community processes that we had developed. There were certainly no um, psychometric analysis done around it. There were certainly no um, um, standards that were beyond our own um, set of na uh, community standards. They weren't based on any. Um, anything else than certainly my knowledge and knowledge of my colleagues in the other healthcare system in setting up san some standards. So there were times where I, I would really kind of sit and worry about um, uh, the competency of some of our interpreters. Um, what if something really um, wrong would happen to one of our patients? Um, what if I was pulled because of a major sentinel event uh, that involved an interpreter and how I was going to be able to really um, talk through um, what I saw as, as clear gaps in our ability to assess the competency of interpreters. So um, just as far as a, a, a person who is who's the director of interpreter services, I can tell you it's really given me, um, it's decreased my stress and given me some peace of mind. doesn't mean like, I, you know, as all of you who manage interpreter services probably know that we don't all have so many fires and many issues that happen every day, but um, at least it's given me really some um, a great level of, of peace of mind. Um, so um, not, I, I, the one thing that I want to um, also speak to as far as certification is that there is quite a bit of effort, obviously, I, I know on the part of certainly um, CCHI and, and us when we started this process of, of requiring certification to get the word out to the interpreters, right? To tell interpreters um, that this is what they need to do to make sure that they grow in their own profession, that they show their level of knowledge and and standing as professional. And I think that that's, you know, we, we certainly do need to approach, um, every, uh, you know, all angles of, of those uh, who we who need to take certification. But the reality of how systems are set up is that I'm not, I don't think we're going to ever see a huge change in the number of certified interpreters until health systems, hospitals, providers really start requiring it um, because um, there is a certain amount of investment and cost that is associated with certification and there needs to be an incentive for interpreters to really be um, investing in certification. Um, so it is not, in, in my opinion, it's not until really the interpreters, um, the healthcare systems start requiring it that we're going to see it um, quickly a, a big increase in the number of interpreters that um, are going to um, get certified. So the, the health systems play, I think, um, the absolutely most critical role in ensuring actually that interpreters are certified um, more than, than anybody else because we are really the uh, our requirements are really the incentive that's going to um, make the profession of medical interpreting um, really grow and the number of certified interpreters grow. Um, going back to the numbers, so you remember when I told you that we started with 150 interpreters. Um, two years later today, we have um, last count 98, um, and that includes our sign language interpreters, but um, about 98 um, nationally certified interpreters between the CCHI certified interpreters and our RID um, interpreters. And the majority of those, um, I, I think about 85 of them are CCHI and the rest are sign language. So um, you can see that, yes, there is certainly less than what we have, but it's not as dramatic as people thought. We have a, 
um, we have really a great pipeline or pathway now for new interpreters. We've added, um, I add probably every month about um, two, um, one or two interpreters to our um, interpreter um, list of contractors that have gone through the um, training that we offer, certificate program or other training that we offer in our community for medical interpreters and then take the um, national certification exam to CCHI. So now I feel that we have kind of built in a kind of a continuous um, pipeline of interpreters that are coming um, to us. Um, we have, interestingly enough, for example, we have um, three nationally um, certified Nepali interpreters um, to core CHI. So again, um, even for our newer refugee um, groups that we've had in our area and languages of lesser diffusion, we've been able to continue to keep up with um, getting um, those um, new communities and those who are interested in those communities in being inter medical interpreters to go through the process of training and um, taking the certification exam. Um, so it, this is a few th also questions that um, that I put out there that um, that I think are, are good questions that we can you should we can all ask ourselves, right? So, um, and seeing what our answers um, are to this question as you again, hopefully are preparing for a journey, making sure that your interpreters um, have met the, the, what I consider to be the gold standard, which is being nationally certified. So, do you know how professional competence is assessed for your staff interpreters? And again, this is the question that Joint Commission um, asked us. How do you assess the professional competency of your interpreters? Um, so, if you don't have a, a very clear answer to that, or if you have an answer that's like, oh, well, we do it this way, but I'm, we're not exactly sure if we're really getting at, at assessing the competency as interpreters, um, that, that kind of a, an, an answer to that is certainly national certification. For me, the answer to that question now is really easy, right? Because I can just say, all our interpreters are nationally certified. Um, and so I don't even have to, to do anything else. Um, it certainly saved me also as, as a director of interpreter services a lot of time um, in having to keep track of how we're going to assess our competency um, for our interpreters. Um, do you employ an, an, any nationally certified interpreters? If you do, um, who are they? Can they be maybe a, um, uh, ambassadors for um, the role of certified interpreters? Um, and um, do, you, do you really, s the other question that often comes up certainly from interpreters is if they go through this process of being nationally certified, is there um, something for the interpreters there? Are those interpreters um, being um, maybe paid more because they're nationally certified? Are they being used as trainers for the other interpreters because now they've, they've really achieved kind of this gold standard in their profession? Um, and then, you know, making sure that you, you know what you're doing as far as interpreters within your workforce development plans and budget. So one of the questions that comes up often is, well, I don't really have money to be able to pay even for uh, my staff interpreters to take certification exam. Well, interesting enough, you, when you start kind of looking at the other professions that we work with in the health system, pretty much every single one of the professions um, that are um, licensed in health system require maybe certification, certainly licensing, and certainly continuous education. And oftentimes it is the health system that um, helps pay for some of that. So if we are doing that for other people in our, in our organization, if you can start asking those questions and assessing if the organization does that for others within the, the um, organization, then you can you can also advocate for that to be um, the same for interpreters. Um, so asking those questions and then making plans and budgeting for it. Um, I have to budget for um, the certification cost and an exam for my staff interpreters. So again, that's why the transition time was important. It didn't happen just like okay, as of tomorrow we're going to as of February first we're going to ha require certification. It was. I planned in the in the following year's budget for the um, resources that we're going to 
to be needed um, and put it in the budget that was approved and then we had kind of a timeline to meet those um, that requirement. Um, same kind of question also for our vendors. Um, so certainly for the agencies that, that we use in providing language access, I know many um, of, of us use um, agencies that provide us with interpreters. So how do we know how, how are they um, really assessing the competency of the interpreters that they use? Um, do they use a validated assessment? It's validated by whom? Um, how many nationally certified interpreters do they have? What languages? So. Um, Priority, are we giving any priority to vendors who assign certified interpreters? And again, this last one goes back to if we give certain incentive and, and we push um, towards certification as health systems, then we're going to see also kind of the, the market and, and those who are in the business of, of um, providing interpreter services as agencies also kind of move towards certification. So um, again, some questions to really think about. Um, so um, just to, to kind of finish my part, important again to remember that a core CHR is a charging certified interpreter. Um, the way that I justified it was part of quality of care for our patients, um, good quality of care, patient satisfaction and compliance. Um, I will tell you that my number of complaints about interpreter services has um, declined dramatically since we've um, used only certified um, interpreters. Um, so, again, I think there's the assessment of the competency and the professionalism that happens through that process um, that, that really works hand in hand when creating better patient satisfaction. Um, and um, certainly, um, we also know that there is quite a bit of literature out there that talks about language access and better compliance from our patient, better outcomes of care. And I think it, it really builds the providers and health systems reputation. Um, we as an academic health um, um, system talk a lot about how we are um, early adopters, we are um, at the, really in a position of leadership in, in healthcare and I think being in, able to say that we're also in a position of um, being leaders in the language access that we provide through certified, only certified, in, nationally certified interpreters, I, I think it's some, something that really um, it's, uh, fits into the reputation that we want and have already as an organization. Um, so Natalia, oops, sorry, Natalia will talk a bit more um, about um, the details of CCHI, but um, we, the, the Part of the, the reason that um, I made the, um, the choice to um, work with CCHI in making sure that our interpreters were certified through CCHI was that one, it was available in, in all languages, again, core CHI and um, CHI, um, that um, it was available for interpreters working and, and address the needs for interpreters working in all the modalities, face-to-face, -face, telephonic, and video. Um, that it was offered across the country. So one of the incentives that for our interpreters to take it, as you know, many interpreters may move from one place to the other, um, from one state to another. And so knowing that they were investing in a certification that was going to be valid across the country was important to our medical interpreters. Um, and that I could use this um, CCHI certification, whether it was for staff or contractors, and we don't really have volunteer interpreters in our system, but if they were, um, we would have the same requirement. Um, and um, really, I, I certainly felt that CCHI offered for me as an organization the most comprehensive um, certification program um, because core CHI it was available um, to really um, know the core knowledge, um, specifically in areas of, of ethics and knowledge of medical terminology, and that was available for interpreters in any language, is available for interpreters in any language, and then certainly the language-specific performance um, test through CHI in Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin. And Spanish, Arabic, and Mandarin are um, in, in our area in our top five languages. Um, um, 
and the the other um, reasons that CCHI um, was uh, attractive for us was um, it offered us consistency, making sure that we were assessing all the interpreters based on the same kind of assessment. Um, the validity, knowing that it had been an, an, a, a tool and an assessment that had already received um, a, the third party um, accreditation through the National Commission of the certifying, of certifying, for certifying agencies. Um, and a, a really important piece of it is the requirements for continuing education um, for credential renewal. Most of our interpreters in our area are already um, in their um, in their continuing education renewal phase because <clears throat> we were such early adopters of certification. And just seeing the interpreters pay close attention, wanting to really take um, additional training, being interested in going to conferences, which is not something that I always saw before um, certification was required because there wasn't really an incentive, but now there is. And, and I think the interpreters are, are always now very excited about the opportunities for continuing education, both because they know they're going to be able to complete their requirements for their renewal, and now because they've kind of uh, know that th there is a lot of learning that happens in those training opportunities, conference opportunities. So um, that's been um, really good to see, too. Um, from a management perspective, um, the core CHI and CHI certified interpreters um, and, and our requirement that all of our interpreters meet the, that requirement, it certainly meets to some extent the Joint Commission requirements. I call it the safe zone. So if they come and ask me anything, I can say they're nationally certified and I'm way, you know, I've definitely met their requirements, but I'm also probably above and beyond their, their requirements to check on the competency of our interpreters. It provides me with a consistency for screening processes and also consistency that I don't have to worry about creating. I just have to worry about them taking the um, exam provided by CCHI and coming back to me with a certificate. They don't even have to come back to me with a certificate because I can check the registry online. So it's really an easy process. It's taken off um, my responsibility having to create any kind of screening systems. Um, it really streamlines our recruiting, training, and workforce development. Again, it kind of is already um, a prescribed way of doing it through CCHI, so I don't have to recreate the wheel by doing my own processes. It has contributed certainly to cost reduction for me, actually. Um, we've, we may have had to, for example, sponsor our staff interpreters in paying for their certification, but there was a whole lot of, of my time and cost of my time that was being spent in creating, again, some ways of um, assessing the interpreters or checking their competency um, that I don't have to, to do anymore. Um, and it has certainly made a very positive impact on our risk management. Um, so with that, Natalia, I'm going to turn it to you. And then I think we will be taking questions at the end, correct? That's right. Well, Shiva, thank you. Thank you very much. It was definitely a very thorough overview, like a manual of how to do it. I uh, really am excited that uh, we have participants who are able to uh, hear this and uh, hopefully we'll have questions at the end uh, that you can clarify further. Um, what I will do uh, next, I will talk about um, the national state of the uh, profession at this point and uh, where we are with uh, other health systems and providers adopting national certification. Uh, so uh, first of all, just a quick reminder, which Shiva already said, is that as of today, interpreter certification in healthcare is still a voluntary process. It's not regulated, it's not mandated. So it's truly up to the interpreters and the health systems or uh, healthcare providers to uh, require that. And since the first exams were um, uh, offered in the fall of 2010, we have over 2,300 certified interpreters nationwide. It is a small number for some, but for us it's a number of which we're very proud because it really shows how the uh, being even a voluntary process, the profession stepped up to the plate and is doing the best they can to uh, reach the gold standard um, of certification. Um, I want to give you some examples of other hospitals and health systems that either require certification for hiring or also some of them reimburse the cost of uh, interpreter certification to their staff. Um, 
I tried to select different uh, states so that you can see that it is, you know, come, uh, happening across the country in Arizona, California, Ohio, Indiana, and different types of hospitals. Uh, you can see here, you know, Banner Health, Cleveland Clinic, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center, which, uh, you know, maybe uh, well-known names, but they're also, you know, some children's hospitals, like Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, um, I don't have here written down, but the Lurie um, Children's Hospital of Chicago, uh, Children's Hospital in Kansas City, also adopting the policy of requiring certification and have a timeline uh, until when they want to see all their staff interpreters certified. And the reason be for that, in addition to what the academic uh, health systems are experiencing, is for children's hospitals, the main uh, way of interacting with their patients and their parents is through face-to-face -face interpreting and if you are dealing with an interpreter when they're physically present it's very important that they really understand the profession and their competency has been assessed uh, more so than for any other modalities so children's hospitals and academic hospitals are really the early adopters of certification we are also very happy to see uh, small hospitals which uh, you know an example here is Lexington Medical Center in South Carolina or Valley View Hospital in Glenwood Spring Colorado who also uh, made it uh, their priority to ensure that their staff interpreters are certified and on our website we have actually some uh, case studies about Lexington Medical Center and Valley View Hospital that you can read and see how they did it um, and uh, why they decided to do that. Um, if we think uh, about the country from the point of view of the patients, uh, in the top 10 states in the United States, uh, we have uh, the highest percentage of population that speak language other than English at home. And you can see here with California, 44% uh, percent of their uh, residents speak in, uh, uh, language other than English. Uh, New Mexico, 37%. Texas 35, etc. And what it means that in these top uh, 10 uh, top states, we have 43 million patients who potentially need interpreter services because uh, out of uh, these 43 million residents, pretty much everyone at some point in their life will have will come in contact with healthcare, uh, be it for a flu shot, delivering a baby, or uh, if they broke a hand or an arm. This is more important than, let's say, uh, population uh, accessing our judicial system, right? Not every uh, one of the individuals who don't speak English will ever need to talk to a judge, but pretty much every one of them will need to talk to their doctor or nurse. And as of now, uh, we have for those 10 states under 1,000 uh, certified interpreters who can help those patients at the level of quality that we all want to see. So we really have a lot to do together uh, to make sure that our patients get the best services from our interpreters. And I've been like Shiva in the position of managing interpreting services and I also, because I worked in a refugee resettlement agency, was in the position to really hear the voices of the patients. And um, I'm very uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that uh, interpreter certification benefits all the stakeholders that she was talking about, but it also is uh, the distinguishing factor for any uh, provider or language company that uh, are providing interpreting services. Um, let me go about over some logistics. So she already mentioned that CCHI offers two certifications. Core CHI uh, is core certification and is viewed by us as a professional entry point for interpreter of any language because this is a multiple choice computer-based exam uh, which is administered in English and uh, it focuses uh, on uh, the following areas of uh, the interpreter's competency. Um, if you look at the foundation of this pyramid, the first thing this exam and this certification uh, assesses really is the critical thinking and decision-making abilities of the candidates because the test is presented as uh, 100 different scenarios uh, which the interpreters then need to apply the knowledge of the healthcare systems and also of the healthcare interpreter code of ethics to that scenario and find the, what would be the best course of action for that in that particular situation. So um, and this is important because in 
interpreters are members of the care team and they need to make those decisions daily on the job uh, uh, and it's important that we assess that. Um, we have questions on our exam about cultural responsiveness which obviously makes a lot of sense. We also have the questions about ability of the interpreter to prepare for and manage an interpreter encounter. And that is very important because they are facilitators of the communication. They're the ones who know and understand both parties and it's up to them to make sure that uh, the communication is effective. And uh, for that very reason, we also have questions on the exam about uh, effective interaction and communication skills with other healthcare your professionals, patients, and their families. Because, again, an interpreter is an expert in communication and the two languages, but they also need to know how the healthcare team uh, allied professionals operate in that encounter and also how uh, the um, uh, 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 what are the standards of communicating with the uh, patients and their families because, as we know, uh, the uh, situation is not always just uh, uh, about the patients. Sometimes it's actually the patient's families that they need to communicate with. And of course, we have questions about medical terminology. Uh, you can see that's the tip of the pyramid here because really in the real life the interpreters always have the ability to clarify unknown or new terms uh, that they hear from the providers. So they we need to make sure that they know the uh, foundational basic terminology, the core terminology, but everything above that could be really uh, clarified during the communication in the moment. Um, the second certification that CCHI offers is language specific performance certification what we call CHI and it is currently available in Spanish Arabic and Mandarin so interpreters of those three languages first have to pass the core CHI exam that I just described and then they have to take the oral exam and I would like you to know about what are the components uh, of the oral exam that we um, require of course this is the time when we assess the language skills the skills of being bilingual, um, but we do it through assessing the interpreting skills in three interpreting modes. Consecutive, which is uh, interpreting uh, that is done most of the time, and it's up to 80% of our exam. Uh, uh, and that kind of interpreting is the conversation between the patient and provider or uh, family member and the provider. So it's a dialogue uh, from English into Spanish and backwards, and interpreters are interpreting that at the exam. Another kind of uh, skill we assess is the ability to interpret in simultaneous mode, and uh, that is the mode when the interpreter speaks uh, while the, um, let's say, English-speaking provider is speaking, the interpreter is interpreting at the same time into Spanish and vice versa. Um, and then we also assess sight translation and written translation skills because in healthcare there are lots of documents that uh, patients need to be uh, signing or uh, understanding before they agree to uh, certain treatments. Uh, and even though we all know that, let's say, documents like informed consent need to to be explained by the healthcare professional, but some things like history form uh, are filled out by the patient and an interpreter's role is to help the patient fill them out. So that's where site translation skills come in. Um, we feel that for our certification to be comprehensive, it was very important to include simultaneous interpreting skills assessment because uh, this is the a very critical area for the patient's care. Of the, in the context of healthcare, simultaneous interpreting mode is used in this three main situations. One is emergency departments, especially in trauma ER, when you have multiple healthcare professionals uh, working with the patient or, and their family, and uh, it is simply impossible to interpret in a consecutive mode. You cannot stop a, one professional and say, wait a second, I didn't say what you still just said yet. The interpreter has to switch to simultaneous mode. Same thing applies to emo emotionally charged situations because if the patient for some reason uh, became angry or uh, is crying, you cannot uh, really stop that uh, patient and you cannot um, 
interpret accurately if you're not switching to the simultaneous mode. And uh, the third uh, type of encounters that require simultaneous interpreting is mental health. Um, most of mental health could be done in consecutive, but when you have a uh, patient who is in the middle of a psychotic moment, who is incoherent, who cannot express themselves, uh, that's the time again when our brains as interpreters are simply not able to interpret in the consecutive mode step by step. We have to switch to simultaneous to be able to provide accurate rendition of what we hear so that the clinician can make an assessment of what, uh, how to um, communicate and how to deal with the patient in that moment. So again, simultaneous interpreting is an important part of our exam uh, and uh, that's why we consider our certification being most comprehensive because we include all the modes of uh, interpreting possible in healthcare. Um, a little bit of uh, the technical aspects is the cost. Um, compared to some professions, the cost of certification for interpreters is not that expensive. However, we also need to think of the uh, actual uh, salaries that interpreters are getting for the job. So it becomes, an, uh, for many interpreters, an issue. Uh, so the fees are reasonable, but definitely uh, not as low as to allow everyone to become certified tomorrow. So the initial fee is $210, which includes the application and the fee for the first exam, for the course HI exam. And after, uh, if the interpreter speaks Spanish, Arabic, or Mandarin, after they pass the first exam, then they pay the second fee, which is for their oral exam, and that fee is $275. Uh, so in other words, for Arabic, Spanish, and Mandarin interpreters, the cost of certification is $485, and for the other languages, it's $210. Um, after interpreters get certified, they uh, have the uh, responsibility to uh, renew their certification after four years, because it's valid only for four years. And as for many professions, we require continuing education, 32 hours within the four years, uh, 40 hours of work experience, because interpreting is a skill. And if the person is not applying that skill, that skill is lost. So we want to make sure that uh, at least 40 hours during those four years are actually spent on interpreting. Um, it is not a large number if you think of Spanish interpreters. However, if you speak of an inter think of an interpreter um, of a uh, rare language uh, uh, in that particular area, in that particular city, uh, they may only have two or three families who need the services of uh, for that language. So 40 hours is really reasonable for uh, those interpreters. And then there is an application a renewal fee of $300. Um, so on our end, uh, we as a as the Commission wants to make sure that we support health systems, hospitals who want to support their own interpreters. And the way we do it is we offer group pricing. Uh, so if you have staff interpreters, and it doesn't matter five, 10, 15, uh, contact us. And here's my uh, email address, director at cchicertification.org. And I will discuss with you your needs, and I will uh, discuss uh, with you what kind of incentives, what kind of group pricing we can offer for your staff uh, so that uh, we can lower the burden uh, of uh, the certification costs for the interpreters. And it really doesn't matter to us whether it would be your hospital reimbursing, uh, paying for their certification directly, or if uh, they will be individually uh, paying it, they will still get that special pricing because of your efforts to communicate with us and we work uh, the details together. Um, I want just to share with you a couple of um, ways to find information about our certification that is relevant to you. On, um, from our home page on um, our website, uh, cchicertification.org, if you click on that um, image which says healthcare providers, you will get uh, access to several uh, resources. Also, if you are looking to find a certified interpreter on any page on our website, on the right hand side, that second uh, button, that second bar, find a certified healthcare interpreter, will take you to this landing page which has the uh, credential verification, 
and uh, search engine. So um, in uh, this area, you can, if you're hiring somebody and they say that they are certified, but they don't have any document for some reason, uh, you can just type in their name or, or some part of their name, and uh, you will see if they're listed on the website at this moment. Uh, that means that they are uh, certified. Um, also, you can do the search by state, by language. Um, you, the important thing for you to keep in mind is the CCHI status, because we also list here candidates. Those are individuals who, let's say, passed the written exam uh, and didn't take the oral exam yet, or um, they, you know, took the oral exam but the scores are not available yet. Uh, so the site is current uh, as uh, long as uh, it is within uh, the uh, um, testing window uh, for the oral exam. So every um, two, three months, you will see more and more interpreters change their status from candidates to certified. And here in this icon with the uh, PDF file is actually an official letter from CCHI stating when the person got certified, in what language, and at what level, core CHI and or CHI. Um, uh, if you're looking for certified interpreters, those of them who were willing to share their email, have their email displayed and you can contact them directly. But you can see that not every interpreter made that choice because uh, it is something that is the choice of an interpreter to uh, disclose the email or not. Pretty much that usually means that they are gainfully employed and are not looking for another job. But um, uh, we uh, always, um, work with employers of interpreters or uh, contractors of interpreters. So if you have uh, a job posting, uh, send me an email or send us an email at any of our email addresses and uh, we will make sure we will share that information. Also, if you're looking for any specific language, we can help you with that as well. Um, and with that, we're getting to the uh, time when you can ask questions and if you can I can see a couple of questions in the questions bar uh, uh, please go ahead and type more questions and as I am going to read and we are going to answer them up I'm sorry I... okay the first question uh, is uh, is Florida ranking lower than California in percentage of bilingual population um, Yes, the, according to the census data, that is true. I also want to share with you some statistics about the top 10 states that have certified interpreters, and uh, it will be very telling, uh, and you will probably understand why uh, we uh, had uh, Shiva uh, Bidasilov present to us today. The number one state um, uh, with the certified interpreters is California, and that's no surprise for anybody. Um, however, the number two state in the United States is the state of Wisconsin. Uh, number 10 state is the state of New York. Obviously, if we start thinking of why, the New York City has more immigrants who need interpreters and more interpreters than probably the whole state of Wisconsin. However, because it's a voluntary process and because it's up to healthcare system to really think about their reputation and about the and it's about interpreters who value their professionalism that's what makes Wisconsin strong because through the local efforts they were able to uh, overcome this number so number three state is the state of Massachusetts number four state is the state of Ohio and number five state is the state of Texas and after that we have Illinois Minnesota Michigan um, New York uh, and uh, Arizona, um, not necessarily in that same order, but the thing is that it really is about each individual and each individual healthcare provider and language company making the decision of what's important, uh, and uh, that's what drives the numbers as far as state goes. The next question, um, will these slides be emailed and was this recorded? Yes, it was and you will get the information and it'll be available on our website. Um, and this question is, uh, Shiva, for you. Are medical interpreters paid hourly or by salary, uh, both at your system and also in your experience? Are they paid um, hourly or salary? Was that the question, Natalia? Yes. 
So hourly is, in, in, in my experience and in our system, the medical interpreters, um, the staff interpreters are, are hourly um, interpreters. Um, the only people that are salaried um, in our organization are those who have some level of management uh, responsibility. Um, so our, our staff interpreters are paid hourly. Thank you. Um, another question we have is how long does it uh, does the certification take all the way from applying to the last test? Okay, it depends on the language, obviously, right? So if you're a Spanish interpreter because you have two exams, uh, it will take. Um, I would say the quickest would be three months. And just because our oral exams are administered quarterly, so you simply are not able to take the exam sooner than every three months. Uh, but we take about one to two weeks to review the application. You can schedule the multiple choice course CHI exam right away as soon as your application is approved and it's available year round in multiple test sites across the country. Uh, because it's a multiple choice exam, your scores are available right there at the test site. And if you passed, uh, you will get uh, your scores from us officially confirmed within a week. And then you'll be able to pay for the oral exam and schedule your oral exam at the closest testing window. As far as the testing windows right now, we have the winter one going on. And it's going on between, um, it started on Fe January 20th, and it will end on February 10th. And we'll have the next one and the next one available. I want to share with you um, the information of where you can locate that testing information on our website. So if you go to our website, the easiest way to navigate is through these tabs at the top. And so here at the certification tab, if you look at test centers and schedule, you have already the dates for the whole year for the oral exam testing. But if you are an interpreter who speaks languages other than Arabic, Spanish, and um, Mandarin, uh, then really your whole certification process could be done within four weeks um, if you are prepared and ready. The application is uh, available online and it takes about 45 minutes to complete it. And after that, uh, you know, as I said, it will be very quick. Um, why do you say you include translation? excuse me, um, in your oral performance exam uh, because, or is it really just site translation? Translation is a totally different profession. I agree with you 100% that translators and interpreters are two different professions. However, our certification exams uh, were developed based on the National Job Task Analysis Survey, uh, which helped us define tasks performed by interpreters in healthcare settings today. It was a big surprise for all of us on the commission when we saw that the respondents, and we had over 2,500 respondents to our survey, said that in the healthcare system, interpreters, and I repeat, interpreters, are asked to translate short documents or statements for the patients. And by short, I mean something like, take this medicine three times a day with food or if you have a temperature over 103 degrees call this number so they were asked to perform the task of a translator which is a different profession and because we say that our certification is comprehensive we had to test that ability to produce these short tests and um, we uh, are going to conduct another national job task analysis study this year and we'll ask uh, same questions and if this time the profession tells us that they are no longer asked to do that, that all the providers uh, uh, really follow the best practices and ask translators to do written translations and interpreters do oral interpreting, then we will drop that from our exam. But for right now, because people are asked to do it, we have to test it. Okay, um, I don't think we have any more questions. Uh, oh, and just as I say so, a big question is coming, so let me read that. Uh, would you say it is worth for a person with a bachelor's degree to become certified in order to make positive impact in the accessibility of healthcare? Or is there a similar but alternative path to promote equal access to care? And uh, Shiva, if you would uh, like to take these questions, I'll read it again to you. Um, 
Would you say it is worth for a person with a bachelor's degree to become certified in order to make a positive impact in the accessibility of healthcare? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think the certification has really um, any bearing on, on, on whether you, you have a certain level of education. Um, I have a master's degree and I've taken the certification. You know, there are people that may have PhDs. There are people that may not have, they may have, you know, high school graduation and have many years of experience that can take the, the certification. So I think, um, and, and if you kind of think about the other professions, I mean, the, the you know, lawyers finish graduate school and then they have an exam, a bar exam. Doctors, again, finish medical school and, and they have exams. So I think it's just a, a, a way, one, to me, is to, to create equity. It's not about the degree that you have, but it's really about whether you can perform the tasks of a medical interpreter. Um, and um, so it's, it's not creating an educational barrier, but it's creating a, a skill and a knowledge standard for, for the profession. So I would say definitely. And I think that um, it, it um, the more interpreters in kind of um, different levels of education take this, the certification, the, the more also we can kind of start seeing what the trends look like as far as what level of education um, really is a good projector of passing the, the certification exam or not. So. Thank you. And I also want to add is that now with certification in existence, the interpreters have actually a career ladder path, right? We, they can start uh, at uh, you know, being hired uh, before they are certified, for example, as on a temporary basis. But as soon as they reach the certification, uh, the opportunity for promotion uh, is open to them, and they could grow in becoming managers or trainers uh, and um, policy makers. Because, uh, for example, uh, within the profession, by existence of the commission, we now ha have the need for professionals and experts to become future commissioners. Commissioners are all volunteers, and they represent different stakeholders in the healthcare. Uh, and uh, according to our bylaws, we have to reserve some seats for certified interpreters. So uh, each commissioner can serve two, three-year terms. So every three, six years, we're looking for experts in the field who represent certified interpreters, who represent healthcare providers or uh, health systems or language um, uh, vendors. So it is important to understand that taking a step to certification opens up your per opportunities for your personal growth. Um, we don't have any more questions at this time, so what I'm going to, uh, before we finish completely, to share with you is, again, the uh, way how you can get the information about different things for healthcare providers and case studies, uh, including case study about uh, UW Health uh, and the recording of this webinar. So from our homepage, if you click on this image, you'll get uh, this slider for healthcare, hospitals and healthcare providers, and if you go to this a bullet called Provider Case Studies. Uh, right now we have three case studies published and right here uh, along with the case studies there will be a link to the recording of this webinar. Um, I want to thank Shiva for taking time uh, to uh, present for us today. I also want to uh, give you our contact information. It is right now on your screen, so feel free to contact Shiva or me with uh, any questions you may have. And um, I also want to encourage you to visit our website and our social media because uh, as everybody, uh, we are very active in our social media, Facebook especially, uh, where you can get different uh, information in a very quick manner before it is transmitted via website or newsletter. Um, with that, uh, Shiva, if you have some uh, closing remarks, please. No, I just want to thank everybody for being um, part of this webinar and again, if there are any um, questions about our, our journey in making sure that all our interpreters are certified, please feel free to um, contact me and um, I hope that we can all continue advocating for um, the quality language access that our limited English profession patients and families really deserve.
Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.